Hi folks, so in this video we're going to talk about a different type of sorting algorithm which is called quicksort. So quicksort, as you may guess, is fast. Um, it's better than n squared in most cases. It would, and it also works completely differently from everything we've looked at so far. Before we kind of looked at algorithms that um, kind of picked an item in the list and then had to go through the list many, many, many times uh, to figure out where everything went. In this case, quicksort still picks an item and then has to go through the list a couple times, but the way that it goes through the list is a little more clever and so you get uh, better performance. Uh, it was developed way back in 1959 by Sir Tony Hoare. He's actually still around today. Um, so in 1959, we were still dealing with punch cards and great big canisters and computers. Um, it is very fast, it is memory efficient, and it is commonly implemented as a divide and conquer algorithm and implemented recursively, right? So this is a function or a, a, a sorting algorithm that is recursive, right? You can implement it iteratively, but recursively it's actually very, very elegant, very simple, uh, more or less. All right, so um, how does it work in a nutshell? Okay. So if you imagine, once again, we're sorting a list of something or other, a list of numbers, what you do is you pick one element called the pivot, okay? And the idea with the pivot is that you need to partition the rest of the data around the pivot so that, you know, we just pick out of our list and we don't care how big or small it is. We pick one element to be the pivot um, it can be the first element, the last element, random, doesn't really matter. And then we're going to set put into our list, uh, we're going to set move everything around so that everything to the left of the pivot is less than this value, and everything to the right of the pivot is greater than this value. Okay, this is a process called partitioning. And the net effect of this step, the net effect of the partition step is that whatever your pivot is, is sorted. It's in its final position, wherever that may be, okay? Um, then what do we do? We quick sort this pile that's on the left, and we quick sort this pile that's on the right. We do it recursively, okay? And that's it. We just keep calling this recursively until we're down to, uh, we've sorted everything in the list. There's only one item in either side or no items, and that's it, we're done. And so it's a clever little algorithm. Um, again, here are the steps. You know, imagine you've got a list here. You're gonna pick a pivot value, say 65, and then you partition the remainder of the list. So we've got 65 here, and then conceptually, we're gonna put everything less than 65 on one side. Everything to the right of 65 is gonna be uh, bigger than it, and then 65 is in the right spot. Now we need to quick sort the left side and the right side. And whenever we're all done, whenever we've quick sorted, whenever because we're doing this recursively, we hit our base case. Hey, they're sorted, and we come back. Right. So the key to this is the partition step, and we're going to switch over to um, the handout and kind of talk through how that partition step works. Hey everyone, so I'm over in the quick sort handout now and I'm actually on the back page where we're going to walk through an example of how this partitioning scheme works because it's the partition that does all of the work. You partition the list and then you call partition again on the two um, sides of the pivot that has already been sorted into its final place. So I've got a new uh, ink out, uh, tool here. Hopefully it'll work a little bit better than OneNote. I don't know how it could work any worse. So um, how does this partition work? Right? Um, this is not exactly the pseudocode. The code itself is maybe a little bit longer, but I think this part is hopefully a little more understandable. Okay, so we have to have a few variables. We need to have a pivot point. Now, Quick sort algorithm, you can select the pivot at random out of this list. You can select it to be the first item, last item. It's up to you. Uh, we'll set it to be the first element in the list. Now, if you go online and you search for quick sort, you'll probably find that they choose the last element. Really doesn't matter. You just have to tweak the rest of the steps just a tiny bit. Um, we'll pick the pivot to be the first element. Okay, so 
my pivot in this case is going to be uh, number five. Okay, so um, now what I do is I set I equal to one, okay? and I set J equal to the length of the list minus one. Okay, so we're going to set it up to here. All right? And basically, these are our two, what we're going to do is we're going to take these two indices and kind of walk inward to help us do the partitioning, all right? So what we do is we increment i looking for a value that is greater than the pivot value, okay? So this is going to be like a loop, a while loop probably, and we're going to keep incrementing i. So 1 is not greater than 5, so we move i here, right? Just imagine this, this is a, a loop doing this. Three, we're looking for a value that is greater than the pivot. Three is not greater. So we move I here. Two, not greater than the pivot. Seven, yes, seven is greater than the pivot, okay? So we're gonna stop. We're not gonna do anything else. We're just gonna stop moving I, right? And now we turn to part two of this algorithm. Decrement J, looking for something less than the pivot, okay? So j starts out at eight. Eight is not less than five, so we're gonna move j in one, okay? Six, not less than five, okay? So we gotta move in again. Nine, not less than five, so we move in again, okay? Four, yes, four is less than five. So we stop here, okay? And what's going on? We're trying to get everything so that everything to the left of our pivot value and everything to the right of our pivot value is gonna be greater than, everything left is gonna be less than. This is helping us do that. Okay, so now step three. If both i and j find something, well, that's the case that we have here, swap their values, then continue with step one, or we're gonna stop, but we're not ready to stop yet. Okay, so we're going to swap these two values right here, okay. these things, okay? So um, bear with me, I'm gonna try and redraw this list real fast. Three, two, seven, oh, nope, <laughs> you had one job. Four, right, because we have swapped four and seven. Zero is still there. Okay, so this is the list after we have done the swap. Okay, all right. So I and J are still in their respective positions. Okay, the pivot is still here at this point. I've just redrawn it to show that the swap occurred. I is still here, J is still here. Okay, all right, so now we continue. According to this, if you find I and J find something, swap them and then go back to step one. All right, so I'm actually gonna put J just down a little bit, okay? So increment I looking for a value greater than the pivot, okay? The pivot is five. So four is not greater than five, so we move up here. Zero is not greater than five, so we move up here to seven. And seven is greater than five, right? So we stop, we're gonna stop here and move on to step two. Now we decrement J looking for a value less than the pivot, okay? So we move J in here one step and yeah, zero is less than the pivot, okay? So now what do we do? Um, we stop, we stop J. All right, so now uh, what do we do? We, they have both found something, right? They've both found something. The question is, are we going to swap? Okay, are we going to swap? Well, the answer is no, right? Uh, because what has actually happened is J is now less than I. So since J is less than I, we're, we're done, right? We actually have, we, we do not do the swap. So the, the stopping takes precedence. All right, so finally, what do we do? We swap the pivot with A sub J. 
right? So we swap 0 and 5, okay? So now it looks like this. 0, 1, 3, 2, 4, 5, 7, 8, 6, or excuse me, 7, 9, 6, 8. Okay, so this is what our list looks like now. All right, um, now note what has happened here, right? Um, the pivot value was 5. And if you'll notice, everything to the left of the pivot is less than the pivot, and everything to the right of the pivot is greater than it. That is the property that we were shooting for with quicksort, right? So now, huh, that's interesting, right? So now, what do we need to do? We need to make a recursive call where we're saying, hey, take this sublist, excuse me, take just this sublist, this part, and quicksort. Okay, so you want to quicksort from what? What was this? Uh, a sub. Uh, we want to quicksort a from i to the end, right? Everything from this is i, this is j, right? We want to quicksort everything to the right, and we want to quicksort everything from the beginning. up to, uh, but not including the pivot value. So the pivot value was at J, right? Cool, right? So it even works out nicely in the Python code. And because um, lists are a mutable data structure in Python, the changes that we make inside these recursive calls, they will be seen, right? They will kind of, they will actually alter the list itself. So you can make this recursive call and then you stop with the recursive call whenever you've got a list that's either size one or it's empty and you're done. You know that a list of size one or a list of uh, size empty is already sorted. All right. So that's the intuition behind the partition method. You need to understand that. And if you understand that, then you've gone a long way to understanding quicksort. So we're going to switch back over to uh, the PC with PowerPoint and talk through the rest of the handout really quick. Hey everybody, just want to wrap up quicksort relatively quickly. So, uh, um, I can strongly encourage you to check out these uh, visualizations of quicksort. Um, they can hopefully help concretize it a little bit. So remember, we just walked through one iteration or one call of the partition algorithm, but we still need to partition either s the list on either side of the pivot. So go take a look at these and please go seek out other resources to really try and understand quicksort. It is such a fundamental algorithm in computing. Um, I'm sorry that we don't have time to like play with it in, in class. Uh, it's worth your while knowing it. It's the kind of question that shows up on programming interviews a lot. So take the time to try and uh, understand it. Please contact me if you have questions and use these resources to your advantage. Um, there are a few additional questions about quicksort that I do want to answer with you though. Okay, so the first question is how many comparisons against the pivot are made in a single run through the quicksort function, right? So before when we were doing this, we selected this as the pivot and we walked i and j inward. Well, it's always going to be the case that we stop when j is less than i, right? We got these two indices. So the only way that's going to be the case, if i walks up and j walks up, is if they somehow cover all of the items in the list, right? So in the most in every time we're doing a comparison as we walk these things. So in the worst case here, or the usual case, the number of comparisons is going to be n comparisons. That's how many we have to do. So take the time, you know, go back, walk through the algorithm, take the time to convince yourself that that is the case. In the best case, where does the pivot wind up? Oh, excuse me. In this. Well, in the best case, the best case is that the pivot winds up in the middle. Okay. 
Now the reason that is the best case is it just has to do with probability, right? If the pivot is in the middle, then there's a good chance, there's some chance that these items over here, these n minus two items are kind of sorted and these items that are to the right of the pivot are also maybe a little kind of sorted, right? You want the pivot to be in the middle, okay? So in the best case, best case, the pivot is in the middle. All right, let's do it that way. All right, that's the best case. The worst case is when the pivot lines up at the beginning or end. Okay, so why is that so bad? Um, it effectively means that you get none of the benefits of partitioning things into less than me and bigger than me, right? Everything is all either bigger than me or less than me. And if you're asking that question, well, that question is the same as insertion sort. Insertion sort goes through the list and picks, kind of goes up the items and says, let's make everyone less than me, right? Make sure that everybody to the left of me is less than me. That's what it's doing, right? So quick sort kind of turns into insertion sort if the pivot is either at the beginning or the end. Whereas if the pivot is somewhere in the middle, you've got a probability, you've got a fairly decent chance that you, well, you know, it's not even a probability, you know that you have already swapped some things. And while they may not be in their final resting place, they've gotten a lot closer, right? So you're kind of, you're kind of, you're moving the pivot, but you're also kind of sort of sorting these things on either side, right? In the same step. So given the answer to the previous question, which starting conditions of the list will be worse for our quick sort algorithm? Well, that's the case where the list is already sorted uh, in one direction or the other, right? So if, for example, you wanted to quick sort an already sorted list, it turns into insertion sort. If you want to quick sort a list and that list happens to be in reverse order, it's also insertion sort. Okay, so you really need a random distribution of the the values in the list is what you're hoping for. Um, and also how you choose the pivot can make a difference here, but you know, that's beyond us. So on average though, quick sort is big O of n log n. So that's neat. This is a uh, big O of n log n sorting algorithm. And where does that n log n come from? The n comes from the n comparisons you have to do, right? With each pass through quick sort. The log n, comes from the fact that this is divide and conquer. And in an ideal world, your partition, your pivot's gonna wind up close to the middle, right? And so because of that, you're, again, you're dividing, you're making the, the space smaller and smaller and smaller, kind of like you did with binary search. But you still have to do it at least n times, right? So that is a big O of n log n algorithm. It's worse than big O of n, it's much better than big O of n squared, okay? But in the worst case, in the worst case, which is the starting list, now I'm not talking about worst case time complexity, I mean, just in rare, weird, random events, in the worst case, quicksort is big O of n squared, okay? So you need to know that, and you need to know when, in which case it can be. So besides the list, how much additional space is needed? Uh, not much. If you're doing quick sort iteratively, uh, you need some i and j variables. You need some like temporary variables to put things in. But if you make this algorithm recursive, you will need space for all of the activation records. And I think we mentioned these briefly during recursion. The, when every time a function calls another function, an activation record is pushed onto the call stack. And these things take up space. Uh, you will need space for all the recursive calls that you make, just so that Python remembers where it needs to return to, okay? Um, and these things can take up a lot of room after a while. So if you wind up quick sorting a gigantic list, that's already been sorted in one direction or another, you can wind up in trouble. But in general, that's rare, right? In general, that's rare. Um, in general, quicksort is very fast and it's still very popular today.
So, uh, study it, know how it works. Please let me know if you have any questions.